one of the reasons you're here today is because you have been for years going to Mondragon to study and investigate the worker co-ops they've set up there and likewise in Cuba. Tell us about them and tell us particularly what you learned about them that gave you the feeling of the importance of this institution going forward. Honestly, after three generations, both in Mondragon and in Cuba, I believe there's a fundamental shift in human nature. It's a generational shift. After people have been living in a cooperative environment for 60 years, as in both cases, Mondragon and in Cuba, I see that people are fundamentally different when you get to talk. To, I'm lucky I speak Spanish and I talk to people when I'm in Mondragon and when I'm in Cuba. And so it, it's a big help to, to be able to do that. But uh, I say that because uh, in the case of, of Cuba, for example, we have uh, the example of obviously a, a, a state that has socialized the means of production and now is working to decentralize and democratize the economy through the creation of worker-owned co-ops. In 2012, under the experimental worker co-op law, for the first time, non-agricultural co-ops could uh, take place. And with that, we have about 400 service and industrial cooperatives in Cuba where their wages have tripled uh, ever since uh, they've begun. The workers are much more motivated to work than they were when they worked for the state sector. And they're, um, they're, they're very uh, pleased making decisions about the prices of the food at a restaurant, about their own wages. And so it's a, it's a fundamental shift in Cuba. And I think that Cuba is on a, a path. I mean, luckily, they, have the, they own the, the island, and so they can make these kinds of, of changes. But it does take an enlightened group to be able to move in that direction of decentralizing and democratizing the economy. So... Simple question. If the workers make the decision, for example, about their own wages, did what capitalists have always said, did it all blow up because the workers don't care about running the business, they just want more wages, and so it all falls apart? Implicitly, what you've said is they didn't have that problem. No, they don't have that problem. I mean, in Cuba, the... Uh the new worker owners in the 400 cooperatives outside of the agricultural sector, which is actually much bigger than these 400 non-agricultural uh, co-ops, uh, the workers ha have been extremely pleased to have access to making their own decisions about the cooperative. And they, al they also understand that they can't provide goods or services beyond the level of income of the average Cuban, which is very low. Right. I mean, Cubans have the inverse of what we have in the United States. In the United States, through our private system, we have to pay for almost everything, housing, food, education, et cetera. In Cuba, it's really the opposite. Health and education are completely free for life. 85% uh, of the people own their own homes. There are still subsidies for food. I was in Cuba in January, and I paid the equivalent of five cents to get on a bus. And so, on the other hand, the actual income of Cubans is very low. And I think that's one reason why a lot of young Cubans uh, want to leave Cuba, because they're uh, listening to Miami, and they're ready to buy their Nike shoes, and they can't buy them in Cuba.